narrow could then you could there be to talk about the flat iron building and here in the skyscraper museum a space devoted specifically to this architectural form and as carol just now said somehow manages to bring everything about skyscrapers together in this one place you doubtless heard people say that the flat iron was the first steel frame skyscraper built in new york or that at the time when it was built it was new york's tallest building um, let's get this out of the way right now not your those assertions are correct um, when, when the flat iron was built, the distinction of the tallest building belonged to the Park Road building, which still stands. Um, but the fact is, it doesn't really matter. Um, what is true is that the flat iron mesmerized New York even before it was completed in 1902, and it continues to mesmerize the city and people who come from outside New York in the United States to view it. Tonight, I'm going to talk a bit about why we're so obsessed with this building. Um, keep this question in mind while well, I've addressed it here with some historical background about the building of this New York icon. As you surely know, and I'm assuming that because you're all here and therefore you must all love skyscrapers, the steel frame skyscraper is a purely American invention. And by the way, to set the record straight, the steel frame was invented in Chicago in 1880, <laughs> after the fire. It was not invented in New York. Among the brilliant architects and engineers working in Chicago during those years was a young man named George Fuller. His family was traced to the Mayflower. He came originally from Massachusetts went to New York, and then went to Chicago along with other young engineers and architects after the fire in 71, I think, yes? And he worked with Daniel Burnham on many of Chicago's first and very distinctive skyscrapers, such as the Monadnock Building, the Tacoma Building, the Rand McNally Building, all those um, tall buildings crowded into that little mile, uh, square mile area called the Loop. Um, America invented the skyscraper because its furiously expanding economy during those post-Civil War years demanded it. Urban land prices were soaring, and you needed more than a five-story building, which was the max if you had a walk-up building, in order to maximize your profit. The invention of the elevator made the erection of high buildings possible. But it wasn't enough to have elevators. There was the problem of load. In other words, the, um, the weight of the building. How was that going to be carried? The, the first tall buildings rested on the ground, and the taller stories rested on top of that masonry. So um, they were these big clunky affairs. This problem was solved by, among other people, George Fuller, who realized that steel, with all its wonderful qualities, could support a load um, and therefore take the, um, you know, the onus literally off the, the ground. And therefore, buildings could soar higher than anybody could ever have imagined, even higher than cathedrals. And this seemed like a really profane idea that you could build higher than a cathedral. But America, after all, was not about religion. America was about commerce. Um, I, I realize that that, you know, one could argue that point. Um, you know, if, if you look at politics and, and all the great awakenings, but um, leaving that aside, the fact of the matter is we're all about money, especially here. <laughs> and, and, and let's just deal with it. So, <laughs> so voila, we invented the skyscraper to maximize profit. And it was also discovered that it was a very efficient way to do business instead of having to go from four-story building to four-story building like people had to do in London. You could have all these offices in one building. 
So now the question arose, well, how do you design these skyscrapers? How do you make them beautiful? Or was it even possible to make something beautiful that existed solely for economic gain? The only precedent for tall structures were the great Gothic cathedrals and ancient monuments from Greco-Roman times. Um, American architecture critics began writing about what they called the problem of the skyscraper um, at around the turn of the century, the last century. Some found it wildly inappropriate, inappropriate to incorporate the past into this new and wholly American form of architecture. But at the same time, many American architects were going to Paris to study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and they would come back to New York and incorporate what they learned in Paris, into train stations, into libraries, into stock exchanges, into apartment houses, and yes, into skyscrapers, such as the Flatiron Building. So let's come back to the Flatiron Building. It was built in 1902, a thrilling time in the world, and especially in New York. It was a time of drastic technological changes, in a way not unlike our own time when everything was happening so quickly that you could barely keep up with it. Radio, telephones, moving pictures, underground trains, buildings reaching unbelievable heights. These were some of the innovations that were turning the world upside down when my grandparents and probably most of yours were crossing um, the ocean and landing at Ellis Island. And making their homes here in New York. Immigrants were arriving by the thousands every day, changing New York into the multi-ethnic city that we know today. The stock market boomed and crashed at increasingly frequent intervals, and the cost of real estate kept climbing higher and higher and higher. The economy was growing, and money was pouring into New York, which was beginning to replace London as the banking capital of the world. And a lot of men were we have the second slide, please. Harry Black was one of those men. He was a Canadian. He excelled at convincing other people to invest their money in his real estate ventures. Today, few people have heard of him, but he was responsible for many of the great Beaux-Arts buildings that grace New York. Black met George Fuller in Chicago sometime during the 1880s. After Fuller had established his own very successful construction company, Black married Fuller's daughter, Allen, when she was all of 17. And Fuller recognizes his son-in-law, Tomasi, made him a vice president of his company. When Fuller died in 1899 of Lou Gehrig's disease at the age of 49, Black assumed presidency. He took the company to New York and he built a flat on building to house the New York headquarters of the Fuller Company. It was Black who gave the Chicago architect Daniel Gurnham an entree into New York when he hired his firm to design the flat on building. Can we have the um, third slide, slide please? Third slide. Oh, here we go. That's it. This is, um, as you can see, the site of the Flatiron Building before the building was constructed. Um, a triangle in the middle of an intersection. And one wonders why he chose, why Harry Black chose this triangle, um, which, by the way, since anybody can remember, it was called the Flatiron because it was shaped like a common household object for his Fuller Company headquarters. The lot was not empty when he bought it. It contained the seven-story Cumberland Hotel, which was one of the first structures in the city to have an elevator, and a bank of stores at its point. You notice that the wall of the hotel was used for advertising. The um, owner of the property, his name was Avis Eno, and he was a very savvy real estate um, investor, um, made a handsome profit just from the advertising. I believe this was the first place that um, electrical advertising was, uh, there was an electrical 
sign for the New York Times right on that um, wall. Harry Black paid $2 million in 1901 for this lot. The area around it was quite a hopping neighborhood. Um, right down the street was Ladies Mile with all the department stores. Across the street was the Fifth Avenue Hotel it, um, where the toy building now stands. And Delmonico's was across the street. And right um, to the other side of it was Madison Square Garden, um, a little bit south of Madison Square Park. Um, but even then, New York was beginning to shift uptown to what was then called Long Acre Square, um, later to be renamed Times Square after the building, um, also a, fill, a fuller building that went up a few years after the Flatiron Building. Um, so why, really, why did Harry choose this lot? The footprint was so odd, and people were wondering at the time, how are you going to build a skyscraper on this little triangle? Um, it seemed like such a fragile spot. People were actually worried that with all the wind exposure that the building would tip down um, in a storm. But we're told that Harry Black just liked the spot. And apparently he had a good eye um, because he built so many um, buildings and he made such a fortune of money. Um, the new company headquarters, of course, was to be called the Fuller Building. But nobody ever called it by its formal name. New Yorkers are always an obstinate bunch. And at some point, Harry Black just capitulated. And he later sold the flat iron and built um, what is now the Fuller Building um, on Madison and 57th Street, which is this wonderful Art Deco gem. Um, the flat iron's actual design was sketched out by a now little known, but then very successful architect named Frederick Dinkelberg. He was a member of Daniel Burnham's Chicago firm. The Flatiron Building um, is a classical column with typical Beaux-Arts detailing. Um, and it has a lot of very typically Chicago aspects. And I actually got that from reading your book, um, which is uh, Form Follows Finance. And there's a lot about, is that only about Chicago or just a You talk about the curved um, angles and the orioles on the side of the building. Um, these are typical Chicago details, um, especially the, the orioles on the, uh, on the Chicago skyscrapers <coughs> had a very practical um, reason for existing. It was to cut the wind from Lake Michigan, which, as anyone who's been to Chicago in winter knows, are ferocious. Um, the flat iron also being in the situation that it is, is, is very much exposed to the wind. So, um, and of course it also breaks the monotony of the elevation. Um, could we have the next slide, please? So here's the Flatiron Building under construction. Um, it was built very, very quickly in just a little over a year. And the thing of it was that even as it was being constructed, talking about it. And all the newspapers kept talking about how people couldn't stop talking about this structure. And that no structure in New York had ever gotten anybody's attention the way this building was. And this, it looked like nothing in the world. And people had all kinds of, um, you know, they'd look at it, they'd imagine all kinds of things. Of course, there was the, the famous image of the ship sailing off Fifth Avenue. But um, somebody, uh, some young woman thought, it looked like a wedge of strawberry shortcake with windows as berries. And then somebody um, compared it to a large, a giant theatrical screen on wheels, which I kind of like. Um, in any event, no building really has ever grabbed the public's fancy like the flat iron. Um, if you walk past the building on any given day, there's always people standing in front of it saying, oh, I love this building, but I don't know why, you know? Uh, but I just love this building. Um, it defies convention. There's something different about it. And it evokes strong emotions. Now, here's something else. The architecture critics hated this building. 
even before construction began, some were decrying the very idea of constructing a skyscraper on such a skinny little lot. And they wondered, what kind of monstrosity is Burnham and Company thinking of building? But again, the public didn't pay the least bit of attention. They didn't care what the uh, critics said. The flat iron was all about popular taste. And can we have the next um, slide, please? And its image began popping up all over in postcards, in the backdrop scenery of vaudeville shows, um, in ads. And of course, today it's still used in ads. Um, and all kinds of souvenirs. And the wind tunnel that the building created at the intersection of 5th and 23rd became legendary. Can we go to the next? Next. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the one after this. <laughs> this is an ad for a host paying up. Um, and the, the legend was, this is where the um, expression 23 skidoo originated, but that's not true either, because the expression was around before the building um, was built. I, I found it in a, a newspaper clip. Um, but uh, what is true is that it became a notorious pickup corner because these guys would stand around and wait for young women to walk by, and their skirts would blow up. If you were a nice girl, you knew not to, <laughs> to walk by the flat arm building. So anyway, um, at some point, um, the Beaux-Arts style, which the flat iron um, typified, became dated in, in the eyes of uh, the world. Uh, and the neighborhood around it became increasingly shabby. But nevertheless, people still loved the image of this building. And from the inception, um, photographers and, and artists of all kind um, made image after image of this building. About 20 years ago, there was actually an exhibit in a gallery uptown of nothing but paintings and, and photos and etchings of the Flatiron Building. I venture to say that today, a time when people are mad over historic preservation and the Flatiron District continues to evolve into one of New York's most glamorous neighborhoods. In fact, um, Chelsea Clinton and her husband are chosen to live there, in case you didn't know that. Um, it's, I think people love it more now even than um, when it was first built, which is, of course, a completely subjective observation uh, and impossible to measure. Um, the Flatiron it's an icon. It embodies the neighborhood. It's the focal point of the neighborhood. It's the landmark. Um, and as one of the, uh, the critics um, who viewed my book said, it's a, I can't resist it, it's, it's a synecdoche. <laughs> which, mean, <laughs> which means it's a synecdoche, a synecdoche is, is a figure of speech. It means part for the whole. So the flat iron is the neighborhood, or you can argue the flat iron is flat iron bodies, something um, that's quintessentially urban in New York, um, and now a, a very, very much um, something associated with youth. Um, it's a state of mind, the flat iron is a state of mind, I could go on and on. Um, so now I come back to the original question, why do we love this building? Um, it took me um, between two and three years to write this book from inception and proposal to actual publication. And I kept asking myself this question over and over again. Um, is it the weirdness of the shape? Is it because it's a triangle, which is a shape that's forever associated with mystical properties? What about um, the fact of its location in the middle of an intersection? There's something magical about that. And the fact that you can see all the elevations, which is not true of any other building, right? Because there's either something behind it or or next to it. Um, and how about the fact that the flat iron building looks completely different depending on which angle you're looking at it from? That its footprint and location make for a building that's so distinct that it can never be replicated? 
when I completed the book, I was no closer to the answer to, to this question than when I started out. So I realized that the answer really didn't matter. And, and I also realized that it's not really a question that I'm qualified to answer, at least not architecturally speaking, because I'm not an architecture. Um, I'm not an architect. I'm not an art historian. I'm a journalist. I, what I do is I tell stories. So I'm, I decided I would just leave the aesthetic problem of the flat iron to people like um, Carol Willis or, or Robert Stern or Paul Goldberger or Nicholas Arusso of the New York Times. Um, and the other thing, as, as I researched this book, um, the story emerged and it turned out to have lots and lots and lots of layers. The story of this building is a wonderful one. It, it's a larger one. Um, a, typical, a typical case of the larger story contained in the minutiae um, about New York at the turn of the 20th century, which, um, as the granddaughter of an immigrant, um, has special resonance for me and probably everybody else in this room. It's also the story of Harry Black, the main character in my book. Although um, some say that the building itself is the main character. Um, we could go on to the next slide, which is, thank you. Um, and, and somebody said that it was actually the city that was the main um, character. So, you know, you, you can argue it any way you like, but um, I was mesmerized by Harry Black. He is such a, was such a complex personality, uh, driven and enigmatic, vulgar and excessive, but brilliant and generous. Um, I recently found his passport application. You can find it on Ancestry.com. Um, this was after the book was already published, so right, there's always this stuff that kind of emerges afterwards. Um, what was wonderful is that under um, occupation on his passport, he wrote capitalist, <laughs> 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 which I guess was an honorable profession. <laughs> 1911. Excuse me. Um, he loved a good life. During Prohibition, he was a big bootlegger, and he was known as the guy who wore all the good boots across the state lines. And he loved to gamble at the tables and in the stock market with other people's money. Um, and this is a really familiar story in New York, especially um, considering some of the big stories of the, the last few years. Uh, but unlike the Bernie Madoffs of our time, Black's financial manipulations resulted in something good, and that is some of New York's most beloved buildings, which, because of landmarks laws, will now endure um, for all the ages, whatever that means. Um, Harry Black put together the deals resulting Macy's, the Plaza Hotel, the Savoy Plaza, the Broadway Chambers Building, which was Cass Gilbert's first New York building, the Trinity Building, and, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, in 1926, that wonderful Art Deco Fuller Building on Madison Avenue. For me, um, growing up in the 50s and 60s, um, a time when Madison Square Park was the turf of drug dealers and the surrounding area um, was pretty grubby. Lively, but grubby. There were a lot of artists and photographers living there, finding cheap space in which to um, practice their art. The Flatiron Building, for me, represented also something very personal. In 1946, my immigrant grandfather, Abraham Braun, together with three partners, one of them a very hungry young man named Harry Hensley, bought the then shabby and bankrupt Flatiron Building at a bargain basement price. My grandfather died less than a year later. He was only 53. So I never had a chance to know him, but my family retained his share of the flat arm until the 1990s. And this architectural oddity, which is in effect a public
public monument recognized throughout the world, connecting me to the grandfather I never knew. So that was one of my reasons for writing this book. I'm going to end by reading a passage. Um, if anybody has the book, it's on page 50 in the middle of the page. Um, this is about Harry Black and his relationship with Daniel Thurnham. Um, they both had really, really good personalities, so um, you can imagine uh, what that ended up to. Since signing him in February 1901, Black was continuously pressuring Thurman to work faster on the plans for the Fuller Project. What with New York's now furious pace of building activity, Black kept saying the price of materials was climbing constantly which meant that every day of delay translated into dollars lost. There was no time to lose. Construction must begin, he said, by the summer. And it will, Burnham told him, that Black's officious manner irritated him was no wonder, especially in view of the seemingly impossible task that Burnham had accomplished 10 years earlier, namely the building of the White City in only 16 months. During that time, problem after problem popped up, Windstorms that knocked down half-completed structures, labor unrest, and the individual architects' egos that kept banging up against the others and threatened to prevent the fair's completion. But the fair had nonetheless opened right on schedule in May 1893. During the frantic months when construction was going on, Burnham had spent most nights in a shanty right on the fairgrounds in order not to lose precious time traveling back and forth to his home in Evanston where it was his nature to take full control of whatever he considered his responsibility, that is, both of his family or the practice of his, of his profession. Among the aspects of Vernon's personality that make him a good administrator, one in particular stood out, his careful attention to detail. For years, he kept a day book in which he carefully recorded where he went, with whom he met, and when. In an entry that he made on March 5, 1901, just one month after the fuller assignment. Burnham noted that he arrived in New York from Chicago at about 7 in the morning. After stopping briefly at his hotel to freshen up and eat breakfast, he hurried down to Hampton Harry Black's office. Burnham spent the rest of the day with Black. The following morning, after the two had breakfast together at Burnham's hotel, they went back to Burnham's office, and there, Burnham wrote in his book, Black accepted Burnham's gridiron design. He obviously meant flat iron. And Burnham also had a strange habit of referring to himself as a third person. Um, besides these few facts, we know nothing more of what transpired between the two men during those two days. So we're left only to imagine Black's reaction when he, presumably for the first time, saw sketches of a strange wafer-thin skyscraper in the shape of a right triangle topped with a heavy ornate keeping with the architectural fashion of the day, the building a three horizontal division, each corresponding respectively to a classical column's base, shaft, and capital. The building's two main elevations each soared straight up to the sky like giant screens and were punctured continuously with rows of rectangular windows. The otherwise monotonous fenestration was broken up by three vertical rows of eight gently protruding bay windows traveling up the middle section of the building, or the Orioles. Um, Bays, Burnham perhaps would have reminded Black, were often used in Chicago skyscrapers because they helped break the force of the fierce wind that blew off Lake Michigan and would perform a similar function for the new Fuller Building, which standing in the middle of an intersection would be especially vulnerable to the elements. Burnham would have explained to Black that the building's bottom section would be of limestone, but the rest would be brick and mostly terracotta, now a popular material, and especially for skyscrapers. The sketch showed the skyscraper with 20 stories, which filled up the entire lot, except for the tip of 23rd Street. And that was because Dingleberg had designed each side of the triangle to meet the other in a soft curve, rather than a sharp angle, which was a novel idea for a New York building. But this design detail was typical of Chicago. Black would not have liked that even a tiny piece of a parcel that had cost $155.03 a square foot 
foot would sit empty. He doubtless reminded her that in Manhattan, any unused space, even the slightest bit, and in the most inconvenient configuration, the amount of discussion here measured a mere 93 square feet, all crammed into a narrow little right triangle, translated into significant amounts of lost rental income. And in the same vein, Black probably complained as well about the new buildings proposed height. By now, at least 15 New York office buildings measured at least 250 feet high. The highest, the Twin Tower Park Row building, which still exists, stood 391 feet tall. But the new Fuller building, according to the design, would stand at only 285 feet. Verna perhaps pointed out to Black that the flat iron location made for unprecedented wind exposure on all three sides of the building, and the taller the building, the more vulnerable so Black should not worry about making his new company headquarters the tallest building in New York and therefore in the world. Because its unique location would make the Fuller Building stand out on its own merit. Not just because of its unusual design, but because there were, so far, no other high buildings nearby to compete with it. And this, by the way, is a famous photo by Alfred Stiegler of the building. Um, and he took it right out. We can imagine Burnham saying to Black, the Fuller Building will look like nothing that anybody has ever seen before. It will be Chicago's gift to New York. Um, 